Howdy everybody, welcome back to Lab Hours. Today is the final of our three-part series on hypothesis testing. This mini lecture is going to teach you everything you need to know about the chi-squared distribution and about how to do confidence intervals and hypothesis tests of variance using that distribution. And of course, accordingly, the Tommy triple I have for you today is uh, asymmetric critical values in, in chi-squared, which of course is just why is it different. And then we'll talk about how to do confidence intervals and hypothesis testing of variances. So uh, a lot of these tools are going to be super familiar. Well, the tools aren't going to be familiar. The tools are like the chi-squared distribution and like the test statistic for variance, which is different than the x-bar template that we've been dealing with for the past two uh, videos. But the process is going to be pretty much exactly the same. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to keep a long catch up and we'll be able to keep this one marginally shorter than uh, my average, which uh, that would be an interesting x-bar to calculate. What's the variance on that? Uh, I'll leave that to you as an exercise. Uh, let's just talk really quickly about asymmetry and chi-squared and why chi-squared is different. So first of all, we need to point out to you that when we have been doing x-bar and mean and p-hat and p, where p is a proportion, uh, or like differences in means, all of these things that we've been doing so far have been means. They're very unkind. That's not actually, that's the different mean, of course. but. What this uh, reminds us of, of course, is that all of them have a similar looking test statistic structure, right? The thing that is distributed approximately normal with a uh, mean of zero and a variance of one is something of the form of like the thing minus the thing it's looking at over the square root of the variance of that thing, which for x bar is like sigma squared over n, or it could be like you know, I could have done like an x-bar 1 minus x-bar 2 when I was doing difference of means, subtracting the thing I was looking at before, the, um, the mu1 minus mu2, and then we'd square root the variance of that thing, which maybe it was s that we had instead of sigma in these ones, right? It'd be like the variance, the variance of the first x-bar over, of course, the number of observations that was there, plus, you know, s2 squared over n2, right? So these are all like a very specific formula that we've been talking about for the past two episodes, right? This x bar, the subtract the mean, divide by the standard error. That's a thing that we've been doing. Uh, and what that has led us to are these distributions like the t and the z distribution that we are going to pretend I have just drawn as being symmetric, especially around zero because of this mean of zero thing. This, you know, t of, you know, however many degrees of freedom it ends up being. So you'll recall that in the past we've seen like when I need to build a 95% confidence interval, uh, I need to get these two values right up here such that I have you know 0.025 to the right and 0.025 to the left. And so of course um, we've gone to the z table and the t table and we've picked those values and we know that it's been like you know x bar plus or minus 1.96, right? Because this number turned into 1.96 and this one turned into negative 1.96 because these were symmetric around zero, right? Times whatever, you know, the standard error is. We've seen this before. This is familiar to us. Uh, the trouble is that with chi-squared, we no longer have a graph that looks like this. We are now moving into a world where our distribution looks like this, and this is zero, and that's kind of the shape of what a chi-squared probability distribution will look like. And so the first thing that you'll notice really quickly off the bat is that if I want a 95% confidence interval on say the chi-squared, I don't know, 10 graph, for example, um, you'll recall that chi-squared looks a little bit different depending on the number of degrees of freedom that you have, right? Uh, I'm not just gonna be able to find this value right here and then take its negative, right? That's not doable anymore and it was doable in the past. So how am I going to find these values? Well, I just have to do the same work twice, right? So, you know, I'd come down here, I'd outline the fact that this over here is going to be 0.025, uh, you know, 2.5% of the area under the distribution. And then over on this side, we'll have the same thing, 0 0.025 or 2.5% of the area under the distribution, which will, of course, in the middle, leave 95%. And then I have to go to my table and I have to get both of these values. It's not symmetric anymore, right? And if you have forgotten about how to find the table, of course, you can go to tmorg.org slash downloads, of course, and it's pulled up here in my little bar, so I'm going to touch it. And then, you know, you can pull up the sheet, and you can 
uh, pull it up and zoom and use it, and it's going to be great. And here's the chi-squared table, you know, both sides of it, which is great, right? Uh, so again, uh, maybe, for example, if I'm trying to build this confidence interval right here, I need to pick these two, you know, critical values such that on the chi-squared 10 distribution, the one value needs to have 2.5% of the distribution to its right, and the other value that I pick, because chi-squared gives alpha values to the right, right? Uh, the other value I pick will need to have 0.975, or 97.5% of the area under the curve to its right, right? So let's go get those really quick, and let's just call those, you know, let's call this A, let's call this B, and we'll record them here. A would be equal to, and B will be equal to. Let's bring up the chart, right? We're on the degrees of freedom 10 row, and I wish I could zoom this in a little bit better, but I didn't have like a little laser, but I, I have not done it like that. So degrees of freedom on this leftmost column, we're going to go down to the 10 row. And the first thing that we're going to do is we want to find A, or the chi-squared value that has 97.5% of the distribution to its right, right? And so let's remember that on this graph, chi-squared alpha is the uh, value on a given degrees of freedom chi-squared distribution that has alpha percent of the distribution to its right, okay? So to get the 0.975 to its right, this is very easy. We go to the degrees of freedom 10 row. And the very nice thing is that this third column of statistics, or the fourth overall column, is the chi-squared 0 0.975 uh, column. So the 10 degrees, degrees of freedom 10 row with the 0.975 column gives us 3.24697. 3.24697 as the value on chi-squared 10, 3.24697, that has 97% of the distribution to its right. And then, of course, we'll go back to the table, and now we need to get the value that has 2.5% of the area under the curve to its right. So we're going to come over to this page. And we're going to look at this middle column here, this chi-squared 0.025 column. We'll still be in the degrees of freedom 10 row. And that value turns out to be 20.4831, it looks like. 20.4831. So we'll bring that over here. 20.4831. That is not symmetric. But you can see 20.4831. Those are the values that will help us take what our test statistic is going to be, which, spoiler alert, it's going to look like this, n minus 1 s squared over sigma squared. That is distributed as the chi-squared random variable with degrees of freedom n minus 1. So in this case, we would have had 11 observations, right? Because we're looking at chi-squared 10. Um, this thing is the thing that's distributed chi-squared n minus 1, just like this thing and this thing are the things that are approximately distributed normal 0, 1, or are distributed as t distributions, right? So everything that we used to do with these looking things, right, with the subtract the mean, divide by the standard error things, those test statistics, we're now going to do with this. But we're not subtracting any means. We're not, you know, dividing by any standard errors. We're actually just getting a ratio of what our sample variance was to what we think the real variance was. So that's going to be really cool, and that's going to cover everything we need to talk about just about chi-squared by itself. And now we can move into how we actually build those confidence intervals, how we do hypothesis testing, stuff like that. So for confidence intervals, we've actually started the process over on this page, so I actually just want to copy this over really quick. So let's do this really fast. Copy that, and we're just going to keep that in our heads for a second. So let's say we're looking at a chi-squared 10 random variable. That means uh, we must have taken a sample variance, and our number of observations must have been 11, right? Because this 10 is n minus 1. 11 minus 1 is 10. And then uh, let's say for our sample variance, we got, in fact, let's, let's do it for standard deviation. Sometimes that's even more helpful. So let's say for our sample standard deviation of whatever thing we got the variance of, I don't know, milk bottle filling machines or like scores on a standardized test, let's say that the sample standard deviation across our 11 observations was uh, f 4. This is probably best as like a test score variance type thing, right? So the question is, can you build me a 95% confidence interval for the true standard deviation? right? 
Or in other words, and this is actually going to be the process that you're going to need to do with chi-squared to make sure you don't get backwards, don't get like stuff flipped around uh, because of like how chi-squared is flipped and stuff like that. Here's the process, right? You want to build a 95% confidence interval for you know the true the true standard deviation, right? It's going to look kind of like that. It's going to have two numbers. But building a 95 confidence interval, 95% confidence interval is the same thing as writing this. The probability that true sigma, the true standard deviation sigma, is between two values is equal to 0.95. This statement right here, when we solve for a and b, let's put those right here. When we solve for a and b, these two statements or these two things I have written are going to be exactly the same thing. This information right here is exactly what a confidence interval uh, communicates, right? The probability that the true underlying population value that we're looking for is between these two values is 95% is the same thing as saying the 95% confidence interval for sigma is between A and B, right? Same exact thing. So. Let's solve for a and b, but how do we do that, right? So you'll recall back in the day when we were trying to solve for mu, we would do something like x bar minus mu over, uh, you know, square root of sigma squared over n. And so over here, when we did it to a, we would have to do x bar minus a, right? And then x bar minus b over, you know, yada yada. Similar process, except in this case, we're not subtracting any means or anything. We're just going to take this sigma the distribution of which we do not know, and we're going to turn it into something whose distribution we do know. Namely, and we're going to preserve this inequality, okay? So we're still building a 95% confidence interval, so I'm going to keep this first. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this sigma and I'm going to turn it into something I know the distribution of, which happens to be, in this case, n minus 1 s squared over sigma squared, right? I know how that is distributed. And I'm going to give myself a little bit more room because this is going to get a little big, right? Then I need to do what I did to sigma to a and b. So what did I do to sigma? Well, first I put it on the denominator. Then I squared it. Then I multiplied that by n minus 1 s squared. So let's do the same thing to a and b. Let's take a, put it in the denominator, square it, and then multiply that 1 over a squared that I've just created by s squared times n minus 1. All right? And then let's do the same thing for b. That turns into n minus 1 s squared over b squared. Right. Now the question is, how do I fill in the rest of the inequalities? Well, one thing I will point out to you very quickly, and this can be a nice little stopgap check, right? 2 is less than 3, but is 1 half less than 1 third? The answer is, of course, no. 1 half is bigger than 1 third. So that tells you. Whenever you take a reciprocal or take something that was in the numerator, 2 over 1, and put it in the denominator, 1 over 2, same with 3 to 1 third, you need to flip the signs of inequalities. So we're going to do that right here. Easy peasy. Okay. All we're doing is we're taking this statement, which we know is what we're looking for, and we're turning it into something that can be useful. Right. So how is this useful? Well, let's fill in some gaps. I know that this thing right here is distributed as a chi-squared 10. So if I can set these two things, these two numbers, this uh, less than number to be equal to this small number right here, and if I can set this number right here to be equal to that, and by this number I don't just mean a, of course, I mean the entire n minus 1s squared over a squared. If I can set that whole thing right here equal to this upper bound side, right, because it's greater than the test statistic, and this equal to the lower bound side because it's less than the test statistic, then what I will have done is I will have built a, a thing on the graph such that when I solve this all back and turn this back into sigma, I will get the two numbers that will give me my 95% confidence like box. Okay? So. Let's go ahead and do that, and I'm going to erase that a and b because they're a little confusing. That's from the last page. We've already found those numbers, which is really nice. Basically, what I'm trying to say with this point is that saying this, 
right? This is true because we've just modified the inequality in the parentheses. Everything is still the same. But the other thing that we know is true based on the fact that this is distributed chi-squared 10, right? The other thing we know is true, and in fact, let me just erase this right here. Well, actually, just in blue, I will write, this is parentheses the chi-squared 10 test statistic, right? That's what this is, okay? Because n minus 1 is 10 in this case. So that's exactly the same. This, this inequality right here is exactly the same as writing the following. Because we already got these numbers from the table and built the 95% confidence bounds for chi-squared 10, this right here is the exact same as saying the probability that 20.4831 is greater than a chi-squared 10 random variable is greater than 3.24675, my bad. I don't know where the 5 came from. That's also equal to 95%, right? Because we literally picked the values such that they would have 95% in the middle of them. Or the chance that any chi-squared 10 random variable falls between these two numbers is 95%. So the really nice thing is now that we found these numbers in the last step, and now that we have set up this sort of inequality right here where this is equal to that, and this is equal to that, and this is doing the same thing as that, all we have to do is make this equal that, and this equal that. The really nice thing is we know s, so we can square it, and we know n minus 1, so we can multiply by it. All we have to do is set these two things equal, and these two things equal, and then solve for a and b. And then we will be able to just plug those numbers into this original thing we found out, and we'll have the confidence interval for that standard deviation. So let's go ahead and do that really quickly. I'm going to give myself a little bit more room to work with here before doing that. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of calculator work here, right? So the first thing we need to know is that um, n minus 1, I'm just going to plug in 10, right? So 10 times s squared, which is 16, over a squared is going to be equal to 20.4831, okay? That's great. So if I solve for a, that means a is going to be equal to, well, first I'm going to flip everything. So 20.4831 20 20 is going to be on the bottom now because I flipped a to get it back on the top. And in fact, I need to give myself a little bit more room here because I'm actually going to end up square rooting that, right? So this is the same as saying, right, if I just isolate a, then that means what I had to do is I took, um, these are going to go to the denominator on this side, and this is going to go to the denominator on the other side. So a is going to be equal to 20.4831 is going to be on the bottom. Once we flip this, a will be in the numerator divided by 10 times 16. So I need to multiply both sides by 10 times 16 to get rid of it, right? So I'll have 10 times 16 on the top. And then a squared is over here, so I need to square root the entire thing. And you might be wondering, well, if you square root it, don't you have to do a plus or minus? And the answer is no, because variance and standard deviation are never negative. So that saves us a step. Now all I have to do is plug in this number for a, and I'll have the first side of my confidence interval, which is super nice. So square root of 10 times 16, which is just 160. I could have just written that over 20.4831. Calculate, that gives me approximately 2.795. We'll call that 2.795. Just do a little rounding, right? So I've got one side of the confidence interval, and it is the A side. So let's write it up in here. 2.795. Let's do the same thing for B now. And in fact, I'll just move this out of the way so that we don't have to erase anything. So B, we need to set these two things to be equal, okay? Right here, that's what we're working on. So n minus 1 s squared over b squared. n minus 1 stays the same, it's 10. s squared stays the same, it's 16, over b squared. That's going to be equal to 3.24697. Same exact process is going to apply here to isolating b. We're going to flip everything, multiply the 10 by 16 over to the other side, and then square root both sides. So we get b is equal to the square root of 
10 times 16 over 3.24697. And let's go ahead and just throw that in the calculator. The nice thing is I only have to change the bottom number. So let's do that. 3.24697, calculate, and that's going to give me approximately 7.020 is what we'll call that. Okay, so B becomes 7.020, and I found my confidence interval. It's done now. That's super easy, right? I mean, it's it's pretty much exactly the same process that you did um, with the confidence intervals for mean, right? Uh, because technically you were doing this for every confidence interval that you built with a mean. The only thing is like you didn't have to find both of these values because they were just plus and minus version of each other, right? So you only had to find one. That's everything you need to see with confidence intervals. If you only want to do one side of the interval, by the way, uh, you just X this out, right? So the probability that sigma is less than B would be 0.95. And then you just redraw the graph so that you have 0.95 here and 0.05 there, you go get a different value from the graph, all sorts of stuff like that, okay? Just the step is like it has always been, draw the graph, draw these little bars underneath so that you don't get it twisted, right? If you need sigma to be less than b, right, turn it into this, and then it'll be the probability that something is greater than your test statistic, which will also give it to you on the right, right? Super easy stuff. Super great. Just get this part, draw the graph, pull the values, solve for A and B, or just A, or just B. Easy peasy. Okay, that's everything for confidence intervals. Now, last thing we're going to do is hypothesis testing. This is pretty much exactly the same, okay, as we've been doing. Uh, let's say, for example, that from this previous uh, example, right, let's pretend we're still in a chi squared 10 world. Copy, paste, okay. And let's say, for example, we've taken a sample of 11 observations. We found a sample standard deviation of four. And our boss comes back to us and says, I was always told that the sample standard devi that the true standard deviation of scores on this test that you have just administered to 11 students was only three. And so he'll be like, okay, so he's living in the world where he was told that the true standard deviation sigma was actually only equal to three, and let's just call it three, uh, no, let's call it three, for funsies, right? Let's call it three and a half, why not? And, and you come to him and you say, I don't think that's correct. And in fact, um, you might just say, no, I'm pretty sure that the variance is actually greater than three and a half because I got a sample of four. You could do a two-sided test, right? Same deal uh, as two-sided versus one-sided tests with means. You just have to pick different critical values, of course. So now that we're in this spot, we actually have everything we need to do to run the hypothesis test. And of course, the first thing I'm going to have you do is split it down the middle. And on this side, we're going to do our critical values. And on this side, we're going to do our test statistic, right? So you might be saying, oh, you might be saying you're, you're missing a piece, and the answer is you're correct. I am, in fact, missing a piece, okay? The question is, like, how, how certain do we have to be in order to change our minds, right? How unlucky does this have to look for us to change our minds? In other words, what is the uh, alpha value that we would set? And let's say that implementing, changing tests is fairly easy for us. Like maybe if, it, if the variance is too big, we're actually going to change to a different test, right? And so we test this test. <laughs> we're going to do a test on this test to test whether this test tests well enough, if you will, or variance in this test is good enough, right? So let's run that test, OK? Let's set our alpha as 0.05. Why not? They say, look, if there's a less than 1 in 20 chance that you saw a variance this big in a world where sigma is actually 3.5, we'll change the test. That's fine. But if there's a less than 1 in 20 chance or less than 0.05 chance, or you know, a greater than 1 in 5 chance, right? If there's a 25% chance that you see this based on this observation and this point of the this version of the world being the real world, then we're not going to like change the test. You just hit the 1 in 4, right? But 1 in 20? 
that's a little bit less likely, right? We're willing to suspend our disbelief and just change stuff if it's that rare. And if it's even rarer, I mean, come on, right? So uh, you might be saying, okay, well, this is great. We can just use this number right here, this number right here. But I say, stop it. No, don't do that yet. The first thing you need to do is you need to figure out which side of the critical value that you need, okay? And that's a little bit difficult sometimes in these worlds of chi-squareds because you are doing a one-tailed test, but chi-squared flips everything when you run into the test statistic, right? So what you need to do is you're saying, okay, if the probability that uh, sigma is greater than 3.5, right, is equal to, or like, in reality, it's more like is um, less than 0.05, but this could be less than or equal to, we're gonna treat it as equals to, right? If the probability that sigma is greater than 3.5 is less than or equal to 0.05, we're going to change our minds, right? Or we're just going to stop assuming that we live in this world and go assume something different, right? This test doesn't actually tell you what to assume. It just says, hey, you probably shouldn't think this is correct anymore. That's why we have terminology like reject the null hypothesis. So let's do that really quick. But we need to turn this into something we know the distribution of. So let's do that really quick. If the probability that sigma is greater than 3.5 is less than or equal to 0.05, then what we need to do is we need to say, what is the probability that um, n minus 1 s squared over sigma squared is less than right, n minus 1 s squared over 3.5 squared? is less than or equal to 0 0.05, right? That's what we need to do. We need a left-hand side. And in reality, this number right here with the 3.5 on the bottom, this is actually gonna turn into our test statistic later. Uh, but for now, just having the direction of this with its accompanying probability is enough for us to just go get the critical value, which is super nice. So let's go do that really quick. And in fact, this may not actually be super accurate. We might test something interesting that I don't know in just a second. But let's let's just use the direction and the area under the curve really quick uh, to go get our value. So what this is doing, let's draw our graph really quick before we do anything hasty. This graph looks like this. It's chi squared 10, so it's kind of got this hump. We're just going to label this chi squared 10 so we don't forget, because that's n minus 1, right? We're in the same spot. So the probability that our test statistic, just this thing in general, is less than a certain number needs to be 0.05 or 5%. So what that means is I'm going to find a value such that the probability of any dart throw at the chi-squared 10 board, uh, that it's less than a certain number, right? Less than a certain number is 0.05, which means necessarily on the other side we have 0.95. Now clearly this is going to give us different numbers from what we were doing before because we were looking at the two-tailed side, right? So let's go back to the chart. Let's find, right? Let's go find this value on the chart. We are on chi-squared 10, so we're on the same row. And to the right of this value, which is how the chi-squared table works, we have 0.95, or 95% of the distribution, to the right of this value. So that is going to land us squarely in this column right here, this chi-squared 0.95 column. Degrees of freedom row 10, 0.95 column gives us 3.9403. So we get 3.9403. That is this point, okay? And now the other thing we want to point out really quick is where is our rejection region? Where does our test statistic have to land in order for us to change the way we think about the world? Well, our test statistic, whatever it is, needs to land on the left of some number, right? This number that we found right here. So let's take a look at that, right? Where would we reject? We would reject over here on the left side of chi-squared. Because we have a greater than null hypothesis, when we flip it to chi-squared, our test stat actually needs to be less than the critical value that we found. This is why chi-squared can be confusing sometimes. But that's okay. We'll get there in a second. 
it's just nice to know this point right here. And if you need to replay what I just said and drew a couple times before it kind of clicks, that's okay. You won't be alone. I had to do the same thing. Uh, you know, four semesters of TAing the same thing will help make it a little bit more intuitive. But if not, you can just watch this video four times, right? Uh, let's go calculate our test statistic. In this case, it's going to be really easy. The test statistic is, of course, the thing that is distributed the way we know it's distributed. So we've got n minus 1 uh, s squared over what we think is true of sigma squared, right? And so what we're going to do is we are going to do the following. Uh, n minus 1 is, of course, 10. S squared in this case is 16, just like it was before. And what do we think is true about sigma? We think sigma is 3 and a half, so we square that, 3.5 squared. And let's go ahead and calculate what is this number, right? 10 times 16 over 3.5 squared, calculate, that's going to be 13.061224, and you're like, Tommy, wait a second, we were trying to test s, not s squared, and you're like, that's absolutely correct, so we actually need to square root it, right? Right? Yeah, because we're doing an s test, but our test statistic is, of course, an s squared thing, right? Is that right? Hold on, let me pause for just a second just to make sure I don't have to re-record this really quick. Um... Okay, we're back. I did a quick check, and I'm not going to mislead you this time. We do not have to square root the thing. Super nice. And the thing to remember, why don't we have to square root the thing? Well, it's because we're just looking at the way, we're looking at the thing that we know how it's distributed, right? And that is always this n minus 1 s squared over sigma squared. So this number that we got right here from our calculation, that is going to be our test statistic. I was a little bit startled because it's pretty big, right? I wasn't expecting it to quite be so large. Uh, but it does make a little bit of sense, and we'll talk about why in just a second. So, if I were to plot this number on this graph, which I can do because this test statistic is distributed as a chi-squared 10, right? I could take this number, plot it on this graph, where does it land, okay? Does it land in the 5% of results that would make me change my mind? The answer is no, it does not it lands somewhere over here, right, at 13.061 something, right, where this is a 3. And maybe that's not drawn to scale, but they've never been drawn to scale in, in lab hours, so of course we're not going to change that now. Um, the really interesting thing to see about this, right, is because there are so few observations, in order for this to happen, you need a tiny number, right? And if we just take a look at the chart, as you get bigger in degrees of freedom, like these numbers just get much, much bigger, right? Like degrees of freedom 10.95 to the right is only 3.94. But then once you get to like degrees of freedom 100, it's like 78, right? So you just have to be really certain. Everything kind of scales uh, with these degrees of freedom, of course, because you're multiplying by them. So it's a pretty cool little thing. Pretty cool little way that this finds out. Um, based on this test, of course, we would say uh, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis, or in other words, there is not less than a 5% chance of seeing this number with this number of observations if this is true. So we are not going to change our assumption that this is true yet. And then you might be asking, well, what is the probability of seeing a result this extreme or more extreme, right? And that is going to be a really interesting thing to calculate. When you draw this graph, this 13 comes somewhere there, right? It'll actually be slightly farther to the left of the hump. It's, uh, it's a little bit bigger than the average, which would be 10, right? But basically, we know the probability value of this number, this critical value, because we calculated it such that its p-value in this type of test is 0.05, right? We found the number that has the chi-squared uh, test statistic to its left 5% of the time. So if I want the p-value for this test statistic, this specific outcome, I need to know what percentage of the area underneath the curve lies to its left. Because we're doing a one-sided greater than test on the chi-squared distribution, whatever area is to the left of this is going to be the p-value. Now, if this were a two-sided test, I would have to get this area, but I would also 
have to do something very weird, which is I would have to treat this as one of the bounds in my confidence interval, get whatever this is, and then double it, right? So there would be like an equivalent value over here with some, if this were p, right, then this would also be p, and it'd actually be 2p, or it'd be like p halves or whatever. Um, but basically, p values on the chi squared are a little bit confusing, right? Because you have to flip everything, you might have to double it, it might be a little weird because you can't like take the negative version. But basically, if I had run this test statistic, right, and this number right here had turned into 3.24697, I would know two things. Number one, its probability value in this one-sided greater than test would have been 0.025, okay? Because that's how we designed our test statistic, our critical value, pardon me, right? If I got this number in a less than test, then the probability of seeing a number like that would actually be one minus this. Well, it'd be one minus this, right? It would actually be 97.5, which seems a little bit weird, but of course the p-value is going to be weird if your sample observation is bigger than what you think is true, but you're testing whether the true value is smaller. I mean, that alternative hypothesis doesn't make that much sense, so of course the p-value will also not, that, not make that much sense, of course. So. Because remember, a p-value is not just what's the probability that I see that value. A p-value is what is the probability that I see a value this extreme or more. So if I were doing a less than test, this would turn into a greater than. And so the chance of seeing this number or more extreme, in this case it would be to the right, when we flip this, right? If I flipped that, this flips, and this flips then yeah, the probability of seeing this number or more extreme is like 97, uh, in this case, 95%, right? But if you're doing a good test, your p-value should always stay below half, okay? A good hypothesis test will never give you a weird p-value like that if you calculate it correctly. What would be the two-sided probability value of 3.9403 in the chi-squared 10 distribution? Well, to its left it has 0.05, which means there must be some similar value over here, making up the other side of the confidence interval that has 0.05 here and 0.05 over here. So the probability of seeing something this extreme or more to the left or to the right would be 0.1, right? So the probability of that for a two-sided test would be 10%. I hope that makes sense and clears up some stuff about p-values that I haven't really quite talked about in the other videos yet. That's gonna basically cover everything you need to see about hypothesis tests. Of course, if you need to do the is not equals to or the flip thing here, just write it out like this. Get the direction of your test and the numbers that you need and then just draw the graph like we've been doing with the means, okay? Uh, hopefully, that is going to give you everything that you need on confidence intervals, uh, hypothesis testing, and stuff like that for um, your uh, variance and your standard deviation, stuff like that. So that's going to basically cover everything that we needed in the Tommy Triple today, which means this is going to be the end of the lecture. Uh, as always, thank you so much for watching. Uh, next time on Lab Hours, I haven't written it yet, but I think we will do uh, a matrices episode. Uh, that is still to be determined. Um, if not, this basically covers everything from the statistics portion. Uh, the matrices that I would be doing would be helping you with the homeworks that will prepare you for Econ 388, which is your, or whatever intro to econometrics class is equivalent for anybody watching who isn't here at BYU. Um, and so uh, we will see if this is the final episode of Lab Hours in this uh, season. But I would just like to throw out to you that it has been a pleasure to film this. It has been very exciting and interesting to start a project like this and see it through to what may be its conclusion. Um, and I've just been really glad to see everybody come and get some help from these videos. I'm glad they've been helpful to people. And as always, if uh, there is another episode of Lab Hours in this series, it'll be on matrix algebra and basics of matrices. So. Hopefully we'll see you around for that. If not, hopefully we'll see you around for some of the other stuff that we do on the channel, our Stata uh, tutorials that'll be coming out and stuff like that. Uh, hopefully those will be helpful to you. Uh, if we don't see you again in this playlist, it'll be in another playlist, I'm sure. But as always, if you have any questions and you're in the class, send an email to teamwork.ta 
at gmail.com. And if you're not in the class, send an email to labhours at tmorg.org or just simply uh, leave a comment. I will respond to all the comments. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, leave a like, subscribe, share it with your friends if you want to teach them the basics of elementary statistics. Uh, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.